and welcome to another episode of Career Pivots. Tonight we've got two fabulous guests and we'll be talking about taking the big leap, jumping off an established career path or a career path, starting an entirely new business. Before I introduce them, a couple of notes. For those who are regulars here, we will be recording uh, the show, so interested Yaleys can watch at a later time on Yale's Vimeo channel. And secondly, I always want to remind people we absolutely couldn't do this show without the help of so many individuals, including our uh, Board of Governors producers, Randy Helm and Ben Bartolome, and our super support staff uh, at YAA, including Steve Bloom and Chelsea and uh, Jeff Feldman, who will probably, there he is, I see him right there. And uh, we've been having a lot of fun and we hope you find this show as uh, interesting as uh, I know we will. Um, Randy and Ben, our producers, do you wanna uh, make it a comment or two before we uh, dive in? Yeah, I just wanted to preview what we'll be doing next month on February 4th. We're hosting a networking event for people looking towards career transitions. It's co-hosted with the Graduate Student Alumni Association and you're, you're all welcome to, to attend, of course, and to look forward to that. And if you want to, in addition to networking with other Yaleys, look forward to doing any type of mentoring and such, uh, we, have a, we have a mentorship program for alums to join on cross campus. And not only can you um, sign up for mentorship there, you can also network with thousands of other Yaleys and current students. And so, um, we'll, we'll put a link in the chat for those interested. And I'll, uh, I'll just give a, a very quick preview far, far in the future, May 27th, which will be just uh, the Thursday night before um, Memorial Day weekend, I think. Uh, anyway, that'll be um, sort of the last, uh, our last session of the academic year. And that uh, fittingly will be um, a, a, a panel talking about retirement and whether, uh, when, when, when you think you should and what form that might take because um, the two panelists that we have, one's an architect uh, who has retired but doesn't seem to have retired. And the other is a former uh, uh, physician who uh, decided he was gonna retire and now is uh, running a, a small farm. <laughs> so uh, we'll see how, uh, you know, what kind of advice we can get out of them. Uh, for those of you who, who are thinking I'm tired of uh, tired of work, and I'm ready for uh, for something else. So um, we'll uh, we'll have that to look forward to as the weather warms up in uh, in May. And I, I do want to remind everybody that we have this uh, fabulous uh, uh, cross campus uh, for all Yale alumni and students. And uh, it's uh, Steve. You want to make a comment about that? Sure, although uh, uh, Ben, I think, mentioned it briefly. Uh, we launched an online community less than a year ago, and more than 16,000 Yaleys have joined uh, in about a two-to-one ratio of alums to students. This is an opportunity to network with people who are pre-vetted, doesn't have the noise of a LinkedIn or a Facebook, and uh, it's a great way of getting to know the Yale community better. So I would just encourage everybody who hasn't joined, uh, it's uh, crosscampus.yale.edu. Not hard to do. Thanks very much, Sam. You bet. So we're off on a wild journey tonight, but not as wild as Amy Jane and Ben Conniff have had. Uh, Amy is Yale 04 and Ben is uh, 07. Um, Amy left the fast track of finance to start mm -hmm. bubblebar.com. And in 10 short years, wow, uh, three offices, over 120 employees, uh, a figure that just amazed me is partnerships with over 120 major retailers around the globe and a hashtag GBD standing yeah. for, you guessed it, global bubble <laughs> domination. Uh, ben has a different story. Uh, he jumped off the fast track of NTS or perhaps not too sure and uh, uh, met a guy and before you know it, they had founded Luke's Lobster which first opened its doors in the East Village of New York in 2009, and now being, brings traceable, sustainable seafood and an incredible dining experience to guests around the country and more recently, uh, globally. Um, notably, both these businesses were started out of the 09 recession, and it just proves one of the points we've made here often that 
A uh, great opportunity lies in times of great uh, disruption. Um, so, uh, Amy, can we start with you and can you give us a little uh, kind of a summary of how in the heck did you do this? Yeah, hi everyone. It's great. Um, I'm really excited about this conversation today. I'm really passionate about this, this topic and um, if I can make everyone entrepreneur, I would. Um, I know it comes with a lot of questions and hopefully we can answer them today. So I, Balvar, we started it 10 years ago. I started it with a co-founder. Um, I had known her for six years prior to starting the business. She was one of my best friends. We met our first day of our first job after I actually graduated from Yale. We were investment banking analysts and we got, you know, the shit kicked out of us. And um, we, I knew how strong she was and how smart she was, but we ended up in business school together. And our second year of business school, you have this opportunity to do field studies, which is like coursework outside of class. And Daniela has been my shopping buddy since I met her. And we had one day been out shopping. And, you know, when we were in finance, we spent all our money on New York City rent and clothes and accessories. We had, you know, we had no other responsibilities. And we had this conversation about how neither of us had ever walked into the jewelry department at one of these stores and bought a pair of earrings or a pair of necklace. And we really were the, the target consumer for the, for the um, category. And so our second year of business school, we decided to do a field study on the fashion jewelry industry. And it was just meant to be a fun um, exploration. And we started with the supply chain. One of the things we saw in the category was that the same product, exact same product was at all different stores at different retail prices. And it just didn't make sense to us. So um, after doing some work and it was really interesting in business school, you kind of have the disguise of, business school and a lot of people who wouldn't normally talk to you because if they think that you're a competitor or think that you're someone else in the market they a lot of people had conversations with us and kind of explained to us how the supply chain worked and we saw a lot of opportunity there was a, a lot of middlemen and no one was going direct to um direct to the factory and we thought there was an interesting way to kind of return that value back to the consumer um, so for our class project we instead of writing a paper we built a website and this was in 2010 like before Shopify, before Big Cartel, if anyone even remembers what that was, we hired a developer in Boston, took $10,000 of our savings and built this website and graduated from business school. And we were supposed to start our jobs in finance later that summer. And we thought, well, huh, like we're going back into consumer retail type of finance jobs. Why don't we learn what this thing called e-commerce is? You know, let's put it up. We'll get some like real life operating experience and we'll be smarter when we're talking to management teams. And so we bought some jewelry from some of the suppliers who we had done our research on. And we put up um, we put up this very ugly website and we sent it out to our friends and we got a few orders. You know, the first one was my mom and her mom. And then we started seeing our best friends. We got and that family weeks, feed loop going. Exactly. And a few weeks later, we started seeing people we didn't know. And the most interesting thing is that we saw a couple of weeks later, people were coming back and we thought, well, maybe we're onto something. So... You know, it was a time when we had you know, uh, just graduated from school. We had not been making money for a very significant period of time, had set up our lives in New York, thinking that we were going to have these finance salaries. And it took us a while to get comfortable, but we felt like this was maybe the one time to kind of take this leap. There was something there. There was a lot of interesting statistics and data. We were really fortunate in that one of our best friends from business school had left school recently and started a business and her investor um, was female. She was a female partner at a VC called Excel Partners. And we had met her a lot out socially and she really understood this consumer psychology that we were, we believed there was an opportunity to service better. And so she offered to give us seed funding. And so we took that and felt, okay, this is maybe an opportunity to, um, give ourselves a year or so and try it out. And so that's how we got started. Um, we quit our jobs and we launched the business in 2011. And it's been amazing, um, amazing sense. It sure has, it's just astounding. Um, Luke, uh, how about you? A little bit of a different story as to how you got going. I mean, Luke, I'm sorry, Ben. Not the first time that's happened. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Definitely, definitely a different story. Um, I would not say that I left an established career, uh, more the opposite. Uh, I left a, a bit of a, a non-starter career. Uh, I'd come out of Yale uh, thinking that I was going to take a shot at the magazine or media industry, either as an editor or a writer. 
Uh, and I did that for about two years, bouncing around a ton of different places and freelancing. Uh, and I just decided I did not like it um, for many reasons, uh, chief among them, uh, lack of success. But, but also, I just found that I was sitting at my computer and I just wanted to be cooking and working with food and working with my hands. So I started looking for restaurant jobs on Craigslist thinking I would do it the normal way, which is start as a dishwasher or start an, an accounter job or start anywhere you know, at the, at the bottom rung to work my way into the restaurant business and, and get the crap beaten out of me for, for probably decades. But you know, it seemed like that was what was right for me. Uh, but unfortunately, I couldn't get any of those crappy bottom rung jobs because I didn't have any experience and I was in New York City and New York restaurants don't hire you even for the most entry level jobs without experience. So uh, I didn't really know what I was going to do. Uh, and then one day on Craigslist, I saw this post from a guy my age who was from Maine, who came from a lobstering family and his father still owned the lobster production business in Maine. Uh, but he was in finance and he really wanted to start an authentic Maine lobster shack in New York City because there was not one. Uh, the only lobster rolls in New York City were very pricey, very weighed down with mayonnaise and celery and, and other fillers uh, and, and not what he thought of as a, as a real Maine lobster roll. So I knew what he was talking about in the post. I visited Maine a lot as a kid. I'm originally from Connecticut, um, but I, I knew the lobster roll he was talking about. I knew the lobster industry a bit from spending time on lobster docks as a kid. Um, and I kind of fell in love with the dream of helping him start this business, but I really did not think I would get a reply back to my email. Uh, so I did almost immediately. It was a shock. Um, and a couple of days later, we were meeting for the first time uh, in a coffee shop below his apartment. I think three days after that, I was flying to Maine to meet his dad uh, and see the seafood business that his family had built. And the next week, we were kind of off to the races. Uh, this was August of 2009. And we signed a lease on a space September 1st of 2009. And we decided that we needed to open that restaurant on October 1st of 2009. So we gave ourselves 30 days uh, to open an entire restaurant, uh, which was a reflection of our complete lack of experience. But the thing that worked so well at that point about our business model was that it was absolutely nothing fancy. All it was was good lobster in a bun by guys who knew what they were talking about and could get the best lobster. So we took this 250 square foot box, painted the walls, built some stand-up counters for a couple people to stand at, rolled in refrigerators and toasters, and just started making lobster rolls. And that was it. We had a $30,000 budget. We couldn't even put trash cans in the customer area because we the bank account was empty when we went to buy the trash cans. Um, it was really, people talk about burn rate. It was like, we need to start selling lobster rolls October 1st or, or we're sunk. Um, and we did, and it was, uh, it was, it just, just blew away our expectations. I think people understood the authenticity of Luke's story and his background and, and the knowledge he had of the lobster industry. Um, and they also liked the story of, you know, a guy who was working in finance, wanting to get back to his roots and the, the kind of the, the life he grew up in, which was lobstering. Um, so those two things combined, I think got us a lot of awareness. And then once people tried the lobster, that was really that was really the ticket. We had a, a buy ten get one free card, and we had the first redemption on day two. Somebody had already eaten ten lobster rolls by halfway through the second day. So um, we didn't think we were going to be growing anytime soon after the first location. You know, more than fifty percent of restaurants fail within the first year. So I thought we'd be lucky to even exist. But the way things were going, we opened our second location seven months in. Uh, Luke quit his day job. So by the second restaurant, it was, it was not just me and the team, Luke, Luke joined and, and we could really go out and, and think about growing the business faster. Um, so we opened two restaurants in, in 2010 and then kind of were on about a pace of, of three restaurants a year for, uh, for several years after that. 
Um, then the, the really key turning point for the business was in, in 2012, Luke's father decided he kind of wanted to get out of the seafood production business. And that was our source. That was what we relied on to have the best quality lobster at competitive prices delivered to our door. So we decided that it, we needed to control the quality of our product uh, and the experience of, of getting it the way we needed it to. So we opened our own seafood business, which we built from scratch up here in Maine in Saco um, in 2012. And, and by 2013 lobster season, we were producing our own lobster. Um, and so doing that gave us complete control over our sourcing for the restaurants. It also, uh, whether we initially wanted to or not, it put us into the grocery space because we needed to find uh, we needed to find buyers for the products we weren't using in the lobster rolls, namely lobster tails, um, that would pay what those products were worth for the quality and the, and the attention we were putting into them. So that's the reason that we are now in Whole Foods nationally and in a lot of other natural grocers uh, near where you all might live. Um, and we're doing the lobster tails there now also our lobster meat, lobster bisque, lobster mac and cheese, um, and all that is in the seafood freezer section. So that's become almost as big a business for us as our restaurant business, which pre-pandemic was up to 26 locations in the U.S. Uh, and, and 12 abroad. Wow. Um, this year, of course, was the craziest year we've ever had and, and involved another big pivot for us, which was moving into e-commerce and figuring out how with our restaurants either closed or, or drastically diminished, we could keep being there for our, for our fishermen, buying their product and finding a way to get it to consumers that wasn't through restaurants. So we threw together a website in five days and just stood it up. And it was a very similar experience to what Amy described where my mom placed an order and you know, Luke's grandparents placed an order, and then we saw a couple friends from other cities place orders, and we kind of thought that was going to be it, but it just snowballed very quickly. We were lucky to have kind of a captive audience of people who knew the restaurants, and maybe they couldn't get there now because they were closed or they were shut in at home, or uh, or they moved out of those cities. So um, it took off really quickly, and, and we've had great success, and now it's. It's, a, it's really a treat to be able to get our seafood to all of the U.S. and not be confined to just seven or eight cities around the country. Um, so it's, it's been a lot of evolution over 11 years for the company, and, um, and it's, it's put way more than 11 years on my life. But, mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's been wild, and it's, uh, you know, I couldn't be happier for having made the decision to move into this, this business. So one of the commonalities I saw, uh, I was lucky enough to get on a Zoom the other night with uh, Ben and Amy, and I always try to do a little of a pre-Zoom so we can get acquainted, but you know, you, you both started these businesses with another person who became, I think, a very, very important part of this. Amy, want to chat about that briefly? Yeah, I mean, I when I look back, I couldn't have done it without my co-founder. I think there's a few reasons. I think one is, um, you know, in a, in a normal job, there's lots of highs and lows, but when it's your own business, I mean, the extremes are extreme and they're every minute, every hour, and you, you kind of need someone there to kind of keep it steady. And if you have someone with you alongside, you feel like you're just not in it yourself. Um, my co-founder and I also have very complementary skill sets, and that is just great for the business. Um, we joke that the things that she loves to do, I run away from, um, and she's very good at it and vice versa. And it's really helped um, a few things. One is just, especially when you're starting out the business and it's like true divide and conquer and just like, who knows how to do what, let's just figure it out and how to do it. Um, we naturally gravitated to different things versus the same. And so um, that was very beneficial. And then also just over time, like because you have complementary skill sets, you also have different ways of thinking. And I feel like we push each other in a way that's really healthy and challenge each other, but we are so respectful of each other's point of view. I mean, she could, she knows exactly what I'm about to say. And that relationship when in such a fast paced environment, when there's so many highs and lows, um, 
for me has been a really, really good thing. Um, things go sideways and having someone that's like, you could ask my husband, I think he has no idea what I do. I like, like the fact that I don't bring work home with, with me because it would just be too much. And I have this person there that just knows the like afternoon I just had. I don't even have to talk about it. She kind of knows the mood I'm in um, and knows kind of how, what we need to be able to like fight through to get through next. And uh, I really believe in having that person by you. And if it's not a co-founder, maybe it's a, I don't know some other person in the org chart, but you just feel like you have that right hand. And, and Luke, you found, found such a close bond with this guy you met online. Uh, ben, sorry, <laughs> I try not to do it a third time. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, you really, uh, when you get in the trenches, relationships form very quickly. For us, you know, that 30 day period, even though he had a day job and so I was there all day, but you know, he would work 10 hours at the, at his desk and he would come afterwards and help finish up painting or, or, or doing interviews in the early morning before he went in. Um, so, you know, we just, we just absolutely hit, hit very low points and very high points together quickly and understood um, just like, just like Amy and, and her partner, that we thought completely differently, but towards kind of the same morals and ideals and, and ultimate kind of goals for what we wanted to achieve with the business. Um, so the fact that he was very structured and mathematical um, and understood kind of the workings of the industry and I was more creative and culinary and, and about storytelling, um, it really helped us mesh very well. But in the end, to, you know, to be able to just get punched in the face 10 times and, and have somebody who's there in your corner um, or who's ready to step in and take a couple punches when you, when you need a breather, um, it, it really helps. And, and I do think that uh, if either of us had not had that, we wouldn't have been able to make it through. And I would also say that if, if I started a business with somebody who thought just like me, we would have failed immediately, uh, and and perhaps that would have been true for Luke too. Yeah, I think that's so important. I know I started both my uh, venture funded internet companies with a very close childhood friend, and she and I just had this kind of almost mental telepathy. She ran our Chicago office. I was on the East Coast in D.C. and Philly, and you know we could uh, you know pick up the phone, and we were like felt we were both thinking the same thing. We I could call her at midnight and say, I'm looking at the numbers. Are we going to survive the next three months? Look at our burn rate. This is crazy. We need another round of funding or whatever. But yeah, so, you know, um, the other thing that really impressed me was, you know, you came at this kind of very different from a financing. Oh, you know, yeah, yeah, I did. I'm not the weakest looking guy there. A Amy, I think somebody needs to mute their uh, mic, maybe. But, 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 Amy, you went the kind of uh, initially, I think, uh, uh, angel route and then venture route. Yeah. So we um, now I don't know if I would do this exactly the same way again. <laughs> However, we raised money out of the gate. We raised the seed round, um, and this was 2010. This was when you know we got lucky again. Capital was like everyone was in you know, taking their capital and writing hundreds and hundreds of small checks. And someone gave us a million dollars. Um, we had an idea on a napkin. But, you know, if I look back on it, and also in 2010, which is, and we, Danielle and I joke about this a lot, like we wish we had waited like three years to start the business. And between 2010 and 2013, there's so many tools that became available that were free. And we kind of like built all this stuff with that million dollars that like, three years later, someone had to pay $50 a month to get it out of the box. Right. And I will say like, it depends on the nature of the business, but you know, it's, is, is the capital worth um, giving up ownership in your business? And is there other ways to have proof of concept? You know, in that time we had decided that e-com was the way we wanted to enter the market and there weren't inexpensive resources to do it. And it required us to, to have some capital to build a website and some, um, some, some cash flow to, for inventory and things like that. And today, I think that's a little different with some of the tools that are available. Most people in retail, for instance, will enter the category through wholesale, which requires like a very different capital model. But I will say that 
we have an amazing group of investors that over the years, Danielle and I have um, tried really hard to pull people into our kind of family that understand how we want to build the business, the philosophy of the business, the vision of the business, and that are going to stick by us during, you know, when things go sideways. And they've been unbelievably supportive. You know, some of our investors have been in the business for 10 years and we never feel pressure from them. They are excited that we're still excited to build the business. And they open up a lot of doors um, when it comes to introductions to retail partners or for hiring. And so there's a lot of, there has been a, a tremendous amount of value having um, a, a range of investors in our business. And Ben, you had kind of a different way. You kind of started from, uh, you know, what the old fashioned way? Yeah, yeah, we started with uh, started with 15k from from Luke's savings and uh, 15 from his dad's 401k, um, and you know I think there was just honestly there just wasn't a lot of of confidence at the very beginning that this was going to work. It was kind of a passion project for Luke, and for me it was you know I wasn't exactly taking a lot of risks. I was just jumping into something I thought I would love. Um, but we were not comfortable as two people who didn't know anything about the restaurant business going out and, and, and trying to raise somebody else's money. So uh, we started with, with what we had and we were lucky that we were able to do all that growth organically um, until 2016. 2016, we finally took uh, a minority private equity investment to speed up our growth a little bit. Um, and we're still... We're still with that that private equity fund now. Um, they've been they've been great. They're definitely long term thinkers. They didn't run screaming this year, uh, which is saying a lot for someone who's invested in a restaurant business. Um, so I think we were we're very happy that we that we did it on our own for for as long as we could, and I think we made the decision at the right time um, to to just get a little bit of extra help and and also some extra outside expertise is one thing to run one or, or three or five little little restaurants as inexperienced people, but it's another to just figure out how to manage teams of people across the country in different cities and internationally. At some point, it really helps to have the, the advice of somebody who knows what they're doing. And Amy, did you have that same experience where at a certain point you look to some additional kind of experienced help? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, it's, I smile when I look back on it. I'm just like how much I didn't know. I still don't know a lot, but I know more, but I really, I mean, I had no background in finance, no back or back, background in finance, no background in retail, no, no background in fashion. I didn't know what a merchant was. I didn't know what sourcing did. I didn't know anything. And over the years through trial and error, it was really clear that, and actually through our investors, but actually our board of directors, which has people that aren't investors, um, when people were starting to hear how we're thinking about the business, one of our board members said, you really, really, really need a merchant. So what does a merchant do? I had no idea. This is a few years into the business, embarrassingly. And... Um, those key people that we've brought in over the years that we brought in a chief merchant, we brought in a chief sourcing officer. Um, and, and now over time, we have a, a team who has been there, done that, is now coming to our company and, you know, trying to build our vision has been incredible. Um, one, it's, it's, um, I've learned so much from them because, and I also appreciate that they've come in and they've heard what we think is gonna work in our category for our business, not what worked over there, but they're able to bring in like the fundamentals and the structure and the thinking, which is what we were very much lacking. And they really helped drive their parts of the business. Um, and there's no way we could have done it without that expertise in house. You know, the other uh, commonality I see between the two of you, and it's so impressive to me when I think, you know, you're starting these things back out of the uh, last recession, but is your focus on the experience of your customers, the, the experience they were gonna have at Luke's Lobster, the experience they were gonna have with, you know, exploring your site uh, initially just online, and now of course in 122 partner uh, uh, retailers around the world. But, you know, that was so, I think, critical to your success. I mean, it, do I have that right, uh, Ben? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, we didn't necessarily even think about that from a strategic 
sense as we were building the business. It's just, you know, it's just, it's just what it was. It was a lobster shack. And I think that, you know, we were growing at the same time as this fast casual restaurant trend was booming and everybody was trying to be the Chipotle of one thing or another thing. Uh, and there were so many restaurants just popping up everywhere that were get in the line, work your way down in sort of an assembly line with, with people kind of heads down, scooping things onto your plate and, and take it out at the end of the cafeteria line and, and go on your way. Um, and those restaurants all served a very clear purpose, which was to get, you know, decent food into, into people's bellies and get them back to their desk. Um, but we were really the antithesis of that. Like, not that we wanted to be slow, but we wanted people to come in, step off the street, and start to almost smell the salt air, um, definitely smell the butter, uh, but, but feel like they had left this hustle and bustle of an urban setting and walked into the coast of Maine and be treated like they're on the coast of Maine, uh, you know, in a friendly environment where people are there to take care of them, to ask them how their day is, um, and then to, to eat the kind of seafood that they would eat if they were right there on the coast of Maine. Um, and I feel like anytime we've not done well, it's because we haven't built out the space or we haven't hired the people or we haven't trained the people to provide that experience. And anytime we've done a good job of doing things, you know, what we call it the main way and making it feel like you have taken a trip to Maine inside the restaurant, we've been successful. And Amy, you provided a different kind of experience to a, a market you and your uh, co-founder really knew in a way. Yeah, and I would say, I mean, the most important thing as you're building a business is your customer. And you need to think about your customer nonstop and every single decision that you make across the business and everyone around your team needs to do that too. And that's the way that your business is going to be successful. And it certainly helps that, you know, we originally were customers because that got us going. But over time, as our business grew and we started kind of diversifying who we were selling our product to, you know, I, I, I became, I became, I was, I, we had part of our business where I wasn't the customer and I had to figure out ways to learn who that was, to get in their shoes, understand what, what needs they had, what wasn't being met and then continue to figure out a way to have a, a dialogue with them. And what's been interesting in our business is that there's so many ways now. I mean, social media is just a gold mine for it. You know, people tag you all of a sudden, you just go and I can visually see who my customer is. People share reviews, they share comments. Um, we have a lot of points of distribution. We have about 3,500 points of distribution. You know, when we were launching and that's, um, when we started growing that, you know, we obviously don't have a, we don't have a field sales team, but we have this group internally, we call it the Baba Bar Moms. And they are sent out into the field, you know, for certain times to go out and go ask questions to um, the department store people who sell our product or go sit and watch like how the consumers are shopping. It's just like our eyes on what's going on. And maybe my point in this is that you have to be obsessed about it and you have to be scrappy about it. And it's, we certainly don't do it perfectly, but it's very much ingrained in our culture about thinking about how to make sure she has an amazing experience when she shops with us. Um, and it's been a, a key to our, our, our growth. And, and there's another interesting dynamic uh, comparing your two uh, businesses, which is Amy, you started online and then suddenly moved to uh, some pop-up stores. Uh, and tell us a little bit about that. Whereas Ben kind of did the reverse. He started with the, uh, the shacks themselves and then, especially with COVID, suddenly had to move online. So Amy, you want to take it first? Yeah, ours was um, very intentional. Uh, a piece of our business was, a piece of our strategy was to remove, jewelry is a very skew intensive category. My next business is going to be one skew. <laughs> and <laughs> like, maybe it's like just in the cloud somewhere. But we have a lot of SKUs, and in the category in specific, it's, it seems like there's a lot of subjectivity in the decision about what's sold and who sells what and all that. So part of our thesis was that, is there a way to use data and, and digital behavior to understand what she's liking and what she's not liking at the front of the trend curve? 
um, use a fast development model, and then what's working, you sell out to wholesale partners. And so we used our first few years to build kind of a data model that sits under our e-commerce site. And basically now within the first 72 hours of launching a style, or we understand what's working and not working within that style down to pre pretty specific details. And um, we then take what's working um, and, and make some revisions and we sell it to our partners at Nordstrom. We sell it to our partners at ShopBop. We sell it to our partners at Zalando, Target. And it allowed us to make sure in such a skew intensive category that we're giving our partners winners because in an e-commerce business, you can control your inventory, but a bet at Target, a, a bad bet at Target is very expensive. Yeah. So it's, it was a piece of our business model. And, and you flipped that uh, bet as you kind of started to describe. Yeah. So, you know, again, the, the key to the early restaurant business's success was having Luke's father embedded in the lobster industry and having a production business. So he bought the live lobster direct from fishermen and he turned that live lobster into cooked lobster knuckles and claws, which we used in our roles. And then raw frozen tails, which he was responsible for figuring out what to do with it. We didn't have to worry about it. So that was great. Um, but once Luke's dad was removed from that picture, we needed to step in. One of our foundational principles has been our connection to the fishermen and the responsibility that we hold to make sure that they have a place to sell their catch and they're not left holding the bag just because, you know, we for some reason don't want to make a purchase one day. So when we started our own seafood company, we were there to buy, you know, every lobster that a given dock that we were partnered with wanted to sell us. And we were responsible for figuring, figuring out how to get that lobster to a consumer. So, you know, it's been through our restaurants for the longest time. Um, the tails, then that became the product that launched us into the grocery business. And basically that model was working really well until COVID hit. Um, when COVID hit, you know, it wasn't just our lobsterman who was affected. Um, it was the entire seafood industry. 70% of seafood is eaten in restaurants in the U.S. because for some, I think, inexplicable reason, folks just aren't as comfortable cooking seafood at home as they are cooking meat. So, we now had fishermen who not only, they didn't have a place to sell their lobster, they didn't have a place to sell their scallops, their halibut, their bluefin tuna, their Jonah crab. There are all these incredibly sustainable species that are caught by fishermen in Maine and they were all gonna go unfished or sold at bargain basement prices. And really the entire industry was going to collapse. So starting our online market was both about moving the lobster inventory that we would have had to consumers who couldn't come to our restaurants, but it was also about a, a huge responsibility we felt to diversify and take on other catch and even aquaculture products from Maine to help find homes for those products to keep the industry turning. Um, because those are, those are our stakeholders at the end of the day. Uh, our fishermen, our suppliers are the engine behind our business and we needed to step up for them. So the online market has uh, a greater diversity of products than what we can actually make happen in our tiny little restaurants. Um, and we're really excited about that and we're actually continuing to grow that diversity over the next couple of years. We have a bunch of new fish and shellfish and, and farm products that we're going to be putting on the website. So it's a, it's a new adventure, but it really just holds true to, to kind of the core value that we have of making sure that we are doing right by our suppliers. Well, and your ability to uh, nimbly pivot, uh, certainly appropriate for a shore on career pivots. So um, we've had a, a great beginning here. Do we have uh, questions from uh, uh, people uh, uh, online with us tonight that you wanna ask uh, Amy or uh, Ben? Uh, are we getting stuff in the chat? What do we see here? I want to open it up. Um, Jeff, do you have any thoughts? Jeff Feldman? I, I, uh, I did have one question. It was a product question for Ben. You, you keep uh, 
discerning the tail versus the claw and, and the knuckles. I'm kind of interested. The, the, the tail isn't the good stuff. I always thought the tail was the good stuff. <laughs> Uh, in in terms of uh, in terms of good versus bad, I'll leave that to you uh, to your to your personal opinion. But when it comes to a lobster roll, I will definitively say the claw and knuckle is the good stuff because the tail has a much chewier texture, and so when you're biting through a soft bun, you want a softer, more tender meat that you can bite through because otherwise you're you're kind of wrestling with this tail. Uh, as you're trying to bite through your sandwich and it becomes like it's chewier and it, it falls apart. It's just, it's not as good. Um, and frankly, the, the reason that some lobster rolls have tail meat in them is that people are cooking whole lobster and they're putting the whole lobster in the bun. Um, the issue with that is that they actually cook at different temperatures. Lobster tails are started at, at different times. So your lobster tail actually cooks a lot faster than your lobster claws. So if, when you throw a whole lobster in the pot, if you pull it out after eight and a half minutes, you might find that your tail is fully done, but your claws are still floppy. They're not quite done. Um, so what people do is they cook it until the claws are done, then the tail is overdone and it's chewy and it's tough. So yeah. we like to separate those parts size grade the claws and the knuckles, make sure they're cooked to the perfect time and temperature, and then handle the tails completely separately. So when you prepare them, whether you're splitting them and putting them on the grill, or you're baking them, or you're broiling them, you can do them to their exact correct time and temperature. So every bite ends up being perfect. Um, that's kind of how we think about it. You certainly got me hungry, I can tell you that. You certainly got me hungry. We, we have a question from uh, Amy online about uh, some of your jewelry, uh, Amy Jane. Uh, and I think is, is uh, the jewelry rhodium plated to add shine to gold and prevent silver from tarnishing? We have, um, we have a few different, we have a lot, of, we have a range of materials in our assortment. So our fashion assortment if it's silver based, I imagine, I, I know we, I don't actually know the specifics. We do a lot of mills plating and silver, silver will stay silver. Um, on the fashion assortment, there's, we have a fine jewelry business, um, which is sterling silver and gold plated sterling or solid gold. I think the key in the jewelry category is um, that we have learned over the years, it's, is the uh, mills that um, jewelry brands put on the on the product. So after you put the metal, there's um, coating that goes on top and that's actually what can prevent the tarnishing. So you can either spend a lot of money to make sure your product lasts or you can spend a little money and it will tarnish. So that's been um, the key area that we've kind of focused on making sure that our product um, has the right amount of mills so that it wears, well, it wears better. Uh, and Wendy Maldonado D'Amico, who's well known to us uh, at YAA, has a question uh, for each of you, which is, has your liberal arts education helped or hindered your journey as an entrepreneur? Uh, ben? Um, it's, uh, it's allowed me to do panels like this with my, with my core demographics, so it's definitely helped me in that sense. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think, honestly, um, I, I have to say I learned very few practical skills uh, at, at Yale, other than what I learned running running tailgates uh, for for Jonathan Edwards College, which was probably my my the most professional experience that I got. Um, but I think you know it makes you uh, it, it helps you better understand the I don't want to say the human condition, but kind of the way people think and and the way people are are motivated. Um, and just understanding that helps you position your brand in a way that's going to appeal to people. Um, and just, just the, the overall communication skills that you gain from going to school with a group of people like, like we did, I think is invaluable. And it's, you can't measure it in a, in a business sense, but it's really there. Amy, how about you? So um, interestingly, I, I, always had a little bit of an entrepreneurial bug. And when I was at Yale, um, we had this thing called the Yale Entrepreneurial Society. I don't know if it's still there, yes. I, it was, there was like 10 members when I was there. I was the only female and it was 
very, and none of my friends understood why I was like doing it. And I was just like, everyone needs to be part of this. Like everyone's an entrepreneur and they're thinking, they're thinking like da, 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 da. And, um, but it was so focused on like launching an internet business. And so when I was at school, um, a couple of my friends and I, we launched this speaker series. It was called Seventh on Yale. And the idea was that entrepreneurship wasn't just starting a computer business. Like Seventh on Yale is a, is a, is a take on Fashion Week in New York. But basically there's so many careers that are very entrepreneurial in nature. And if we allow these people to come in and tell us what they do, you're going to realize like your interests are very entrepreneurial, a chef, a writer, um, a fashion designer. And we had all these really interesting people come in and talk. And it was the first time, and I remember running this at Yale, and I, it was the first time that I realized like, well, like I really can be an entrepreneur. I don't have to go start a computer business. Like I can go start a restaurant. I can go start this. And it really um, gave me the bug. And it's a very specific example, but it's kind of similar to what Ben's saying. It's just, you're around all of these very creative people. Um, and I always felt that way when I was at Yale, that there was just so many people that had so many interesting ideas and things to say. And finally, I figured out a framework for myself, which was just that um, going down this path could still be very creative. It's not this like very, very narrow, like go start an internet business. And that helped me. It helped me go start a jewelry business, which would never have anticipated. Which you have done in spades. Um, Nia's asking, what about work-life balance for each of you as you scaled your businesses? Uh, ben? Not great. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, you know, for, for the first couple of years, it was completely non-existent. It was, you know, more than 100 hours a week. Uh, and I didn't, you know, I kind of, my friends were wondered where I'd gone, uh, just just kind of vanished uh, for a while, but slowly kind of built it back uh, bit by bit, and and found ways, you know, to. Uh, it, it's not that I it's not that I didn't trust my team. Uh, it was really just that we were constantly looking for the next mountain to climb. Uh, we were always just on to the next thing and. And trying to perfect what we had at the same time and and also just i will say there's the one thing that i you have to try to work out of your system is kind of a guilt of knowing that when your team is working when you're not working and that for the restaurant industry when you're open you know seven days a week sometimes even 365 days a year um that it never feels right to not be working because someone on your team is always working um, so it's been really hard, but I think now, especially now that I'm finally found somebody who would marry me, uh, I've done a better job of carving out that time and, and really carving out the mental space too, to not feel guilty about not working and, and be able to enjoy my time off better. And Amy, I know uh, you have two young ones at home, um, and, uh, you know, how would you respond to this uh, question? So um, I think two ways, you know, I worked in finance before this, which was quite demanding. And so I really do like working for myself and deciding what's important and being able to be very efficient with my time. Um, it's nice if you're going to work that hard, like you're, you're kind of driving, it's like you get to drive your business and you get to drive the outcome. Uh, and so I, I haven't minded that pace of it. Um, but I will say I had two girls um, in the last five years and that's been an interesting um, dynamic to add in. It has um, certainly kind of, you know, creates a kind of a push and pull of where you spend your time. And it's similar to what Ben says, you're always a little conflicted. Um, I will say that having kids really helped um, me be more efficient with my time and actually be more effective at work, which is very interesting because you have a less amount of time. And as an entrepreneur who owns their business, you're just going to give 100%. And sometimes just giving more time doesn't yield better work. And so I got some really advice when I had kids and someone had said, you know, look at your to-do list and just don't do a couple of things for a few weeks and see what happens. And I didn't do it nothing happened to the business. And then I did it again and nothing happened to the business. I just found I was filling my time because I, it's my business. I just want to keep trying to do stuff to make it grow. Um, and then I will also say this past year, you know, with 
with how crazy it's been, um, it's been a blessing to be at home. Um, maybe it's the first time I've had a setup at home. I just feel for the first time I'm good at work and I'm good as a mom. And it's a great feeling. Um, it's certainly great to feel like I can have a career. And I certainly hear that from a lot of um, women at my company who feel that finally they're getting to be able to do it all. And I don't know, just to kind of make it work. And if you go in knowing that it's going to be an excruciating amount of work with a lot of emotional highs and lows, but a lot of reward, um, you you kind of end up being okay with it because you made a decision yourself. Um, we've got, uh, yeah, that, that, that was great. Um, I'm fascinated because I hear so many uh, uh, parents, you know, saying with COVID, it's just been kind of a nightmare. I mean, they, they're at home, the kids are on their own laptops at home trying to manage Zoom school. And, you know, but it's, it's refreshing to hear your experience. I, I love that. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's, it's <laughs> a party over here. <laughs> Well, and I, I hear the parties are good there too, but we won't go there any beyond that. Uh, uh, Victor's asking Ben a supply chain question. Uh, he started a food beverage business in the Caribbean. And one of the biggest challenges has been developing consistent shipping supply chain. Uh, he's asking, you know, how did you work out the challenges of transporting to your different locations? We're looking to unmute Ben. Sorry, my window, my window is stuck over the mute button. Um, I, I was, I was in the chat, but um, so uh, figuring out transportation logistics, we were very lucky in that Luke's father was in this business prior to Luke's Lobster existing, so he was already in the business of shipping lobster around the country and around the world. So he really had the logistics well. Um, kind of laid out before we got into that side of the business. But we do source all of our lobster from either Maine in Maine's busiest lobster seasons, which are basically July through December, or from Canada when the Canadian fishermen are really out fishing hard, which is December, and then again in May and June. Um, so we try to work with the seasonality of the fishery to keep in that rhythm the way the fishermen do. Um, but basically we get, you know, huge shipments of live lobster in on full trucks into our facility in Saco, Maine. And then we send full trucks out, uh, that get to a hub and then spoke out onto, you know, portions of full trucks that go elsewhere. So we're never trying to send a truck that's not full of some type of seafood anywhere. Um, that's how we kind of keep both cost efficient and, and environmentally more efficient as well. Um, when we ship to, uh, to Japan or Taiwan or Singapore, we're actually liquid nitrogen freezing all the product and putting it in a frozen container uh, on a ship. And we're actually sending that by boat uh, over a span of a few weeks so that we're not incurring that that carbon footprint and that cost of, of air freighting everything over there. Um, and I think I just, uh, are you, are you going to go on to the environmental questions next? Cause I, we yes, missed yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. make sure we get that. Yeah, you, yeah. I can, I, I'll, I can take that now cause I know it also, I'm sure it also has something that Amy wants to answer. But, um, we started out focused, completely on sustainable seafood. And someone asked earlier, what does that mean? It means you have a, a stable and growing population of a given species. You have strict rules in place to make sure that species can't be overfished um, and also rules to manage any other external effects it can have on the environment. So um, any species that we sell through our restaurants, through our website, through grocery fits that description. Um, many have special eco certifications, but that's not really necessary because a lot of fisheries are just too small. They don't have the money to go out and get an eco certification. So it's really all about understanding how fishermen fish, what rules they must abide by. And then in an example like Jonah crab in New England, the rules weren't 
really codified well enough because Jonah crab was was kind of a an underutilized species that wasn't particularly well managed. As the demand grew, as we sold more and more of it, we did what's called a fishery improvement project. So we engaged with the industry and with with other buyers. And we actually worked with regulators to put new rules in place that made sure that Jonah crab fishery was sustainable. Um, now, in addition to focusing on seafood sustainability, um, we've been a certified B Corp for three years and that helped us really analyze the rest of our environmental footprint as well. So now we're really focused on our, our climate impact, how climate change is affecting the Gulf of Maine uh, and all the fisheries that we work with, and therefore you know, how much we can reduce the impact of our entire supply chain. For example, we're going to move our entire main operations over to a community solar program this year so that we'll be using 100% renewable energy. Um, wow. Then we're gonna to try to bring that same idea to our individual docks um, and, and get them on solar as well, either on their own panels or on community solar. Um, and after that, we'll turn towards, you know, our trucking and our, and our boat engines. And hopefully, you know, 10 years from now, we'll be talking about electrified engines. Um, fascinating. Steve Bloom, did you uh, want to ask something before we wind up here? Sure, I had a question actually. First of all, again, Amy and Ben, thanks very much, uh, both for being candid, uh, smart, funny, and wise all at the same time. That was great. Um, so my question for Amy, which I think I may have sent to her private chat box, was uh, you mentioned earlier that you and Daniela, you know, run the other way from certain things. Um, can you give one or two examples of what she runs away from that you don't and vice versa. And then for Ben, um, just thinking ahead there, you mentioned, I'm curious, the private equity investor, you can be thinking about this. What's, what's one thing that they wish you did a little differently even now? So that'll be my question for Ben. Sounds good. So for me and Dee, you know, it's interesting. It's not um, as clean cut as you would think about complementary skill sets. So an example that could be clean cut is like, she sees a video camera and she runs to it. I run the other way. Um, <laughs> she's like amazing telling our story. She is very funny uh, and she's wonderful on TV and podcasts and all this. And she's loves doing it. Um, another thing I thought that I was okay at that she's amazing at is finance. You give her an Excel sheet and you're gonna have the most beautiful model. Um, and she understands it's just math and finance in a way that I, I, I don't. Um, but we have over the years kind of figured out some of those things, you know? And like, even if there are two things that we both like, like some of those things are she's just better at. And naturally at some point, you know, there's a finite amount of time. You just want to get the best work done and you trust each other so much that, um, and there's also stuff she doesn't like to do, but she just knows I'm bad at it. Like PowerPoint, very bad at it. I don't know how I got through <laughs> banking. I used to have a PowerPoint department. I didn't know how to use PowerPoint myself. She's amazing. She can put together a PowerPoint presentation like that. So she'll just do it. And that's where um, our relationship is just so strong and so nimble and um, so easy uh, that she'll just jump in and say, let me do that for you. Um, why don't you go, why don't you go elsewhere? So it's not always the opposites. It's the more goods and the less bads sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's Got a good. It. Okay. Ben, how about that question about private equity? You know, there's got to be at least one thing that they wish you did even better. Yeah. Um, well, so I, I'll I'll spin this question a little bit to say, like, what do what would most what would most private equity investors want us to do differently? Um, and that is be less complex. Um, I think our investor understands the benefits of our complexity, um, but. The vertical integration of our business in both restaurants and manufacturing and now e-commerce and grocery, uh, the multitude of species we're working with, the multitude of products that we're working with. If you just look at the restaurant box, you see a lobster roll, a crab roll, a shrimp roll, a clam chowder, some drinks and some chips. And you think, wow, this is the simplest business on earth. This is so scalable. The unit economics are fantastic. Let's forget about everything else and let's just go build a hundred of these little fancy boxes of, 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 of restaurant businesses. Um, but that wouldn't work. The only reason it works 
is the direct connection to the fishermen, the fishery, the complete control of the process, the quality, um, and, and honestly, the passion that we have for the full 360 degrees of the industry and the business that we're in. And that is what allows us to serve the product that we serve in those nifty little efficient boxes. Um, and it's also what I think our customers love about us is that we're not just here to um, cookie cutter out a hundred little boxes that can efficiently make you a lobster roll. It's like we're in it because the lobster men are our family and the people at our plant in Saco are our family. And it's important to us to be grounded in where your food comes from and the entire system that is necessary to get it from the ocean to the basket that you're eating it in, in, in the restaurant. And we have no desire to cut that quote unquote complexity out of, out of what we do. So it's just a matter of finding investors who can really think deeply about the value of that level of integration in your business um, and, and then can help you communicate that to your customers so that you're in the end getting, getting the value for, for all the effort that you're putting in. Thanks, Ben. So at the end of our hour here, um, I can't thank you, Ben and Amy, enough. Um, I want to call out, you know, Luke's Lobster. You can find it online in a nanosecond and Bobble Bar. And uh, you can also get on YouTube and, uh, uh, you know, search on Luke's Lobster and Bobble Bar or Amy Jane and, and, and find out some more just nuggets of great information as they've both been generous about kind of what they do. And you can experience uh, what they're doing by going to their websites and, and also to Nordstrom. Target, or in uh, Ben's case, uh, Luke's Lobster. So I encourage you all to do that. Get on cross campus. Um, this has just been so much fun. What a great way to start what we all hope is going to be a wonderful new year. Uh, thank you all for your questions. Thanks for being here. February 4th, we're back with Career Pivots and a very interesting networking uh, uh, experiment. And we're always looking for your feedback. Please let us know how we could engage you more, be better. Uh, and I think uh, that about says it for us. Get on cross campus. And uh, uh, Jeff, did you want to add something? Yeah, if you don't, if you don't mind, I just want to know there are show, shows next Thursday, th Thursday after, and so forth. Can I do a quick show screen share? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, just to guy give everybody a, a sense, if you can see that, that's what's coming up. We had the the leap tonight. Uh, next week is reemergence. Re well, this is what we did: reemergence in the COVID. Next week. Uh, more beautiful world afterwards, business operations, biotech, and, and more coming. So I, it's all about must see ELE. And uh, yeah, thanks for coming. It's just a great, going to be a great year for us. Thanks again, uh, Ben and Amy. Uh, so nice of you to share, uh, you, know, you know, the kind of hours you work, and we appreciate it so much. Uh, good night, everybody.